Good evening, folks, and welcome to another segment of live stream chatting with Cayman Law Road. Um, great to have you guys here this evening. I trust that um, you all enjoyed the agriculture show yesterday. I think they had a wonderful turnout. I must say that um, for me, the amazing thing is on that particular day, I think that's a single day that you can see that many Caymanians and just everyone visitors alike um, to your island having an absolutely wonderful time and enjoying themselves and it's very refreshing to be able to see all of the animals on display uh, obviously they had a number of very large animals there um, i'm always surprised at the roosters in particular the award-winning roosters that they have and how big they can get they're just like amazing so this evening we have a very interesting discussion lined up for you um, it's a bit of a serious topic, so I hope that you guys will tune in. Please definitely you know, share the link, get people involved in this discussion, because this is a topic that we're going to have time and time again, but it impacts every single one of us. And there's no way around it. So next week's segment, we are actually going to have with us on air someone who is a sexual abuse survivor. And that's just amazing for us to get someone who can come forward, share her experiences, what she went through. Um, and she's actually overcome so much in her life. She's now a mother of two lovely children, um, married and has a wonderful family. And she's also a doctor. So, you know, she's had professional success, personal success, and she has a very strong belief um, in God. And I think she has a lot that she can share with us in terms of how she overcame her personal situation and her personal ordeal. So that will be next week, Tuesday. I hope that you guys will tune in uh, for that discussion. But I wanted to start this evening's program by addressing a couple of things that I've seen on social media. So for me, it's particularly disturbing when I see persons questioning situations that we see in the media about alleged child molestation. And I think it's a conversation here in Cayman that we definitely need to have because it just doesn't seem that the message is getting through time and time again. You know, the courts are failing us. Um, the churches are failing us in this regard. There are community leaders that are failing us. A lot of them are not making this a serious topic. We don't have legislation in place, in my opinion, that we should have to really address the issue of child abuse and in particular child molestation. So it continues to be a real sore point for me and it grows every single time I see comments on Facebook in particular where people are saying things like, oh, well, the media is just attacking uh, Michael Jackson. They're just attacking R. Kelly. You know, there's this um, sentiment that all of a sudden now the entire world is contriving and, in, in, you know, trying to take down black artists. And then people throw out this very skewed logic. Well, why aren't they attacking the churches? Why aren't they going after the, the Harvey Weinsteins? I'm like, actually, they are. You know, everybody knows the scandals with the Catholic Church, and they continue on a daily basis to be highlighted. And priests are continually in the news. And that is something that isn't going to go away. Victims are coming forward. And I want to talk about, as part of this discussion this evening, why we as communities always want to attack victims. Why are we always questioning the victim? Why didn't you tell somebody? Why didn't you do this? Why didn't you do that? I mean, to me, it's absolutely amazing that those are the first questions that we have in a situation, as opposed to looking at a perpetrator and saying, why are you molesting people's children? Because that is the real wrong here. Rajiv, thank you so much for tuning in from the UK. I appreciate the support very, very much. Um, I think we have a few other people tuned in from the UK. Jevi is supposed to be joining us as well. <clears throat> Sorry, so hopefully he's tuned into the conversation because Jevy did have a comment on his Facebook social media page earlier that um, certainly prompted me 
as well as other people to really have this discussion. I'm going to, I'm going to share Jevy's comment and I'm going to share a couple others from social media. So I'm just going to pull these up here on my phone to kind of put this conversation in context, because I think it's essential, you know, that we have this dialogue as much as we need to, for this to really, um, <clears throat> sorry, for this to really, you know, I think just really come through. So um, he posted eight hours ago, Jevy said, unpopular opinion, Michael ain't touched those kids. Well, I hate to say it, but that's actually not an unpopular opinion. There are a lot of people who would rather live in denial that Michael Jackson is innocent and he did not molest or abuse children. So I wanna talk about specifically why we can say that after knowing as much as we know about Michael Jackson. Why is it that the general population doesn't go, there's something seriously wrong with someone like him. There's, someone, there's something seriously wrong with someone like an R. Kelly who continues to have inappropriate relationships, whether they want to coin it as friendships or whatever they want to call it, right? Because they always have an excuse. And we're going to look at some of those excuses and some of the grooming that has actually happened with not just the victims themselves, but also like the wider public, you know, because we have been hoodwinked into accepting what under normal circumstances would be absolutely horrendous behavior We've been hoodwinked into looking the other way because these individuals are celebrities. And they're and I want to examine, examine, sorry, some of their predatory behavior that has led us to where we are. So Carmelie has just joined the discussion. Good evening, Carmelie. Thanks for joining in. We appreciate you logging in. Sylvia. Um, is tuned in from Toronto. Sylvia, thank you so much for tuning in from Toronto, Canada. We appreciate the international um, audience that's here because unfortunately child abuse is not something that is unique to the Cayman Islands. This is something that people from all walks of life and all communities um, have to deal with. And so this is why it's critical, I think, that we have the discussion. But in our small little island, we need to broaden our perspective about what's going on in the world around us. So if you're just joining the discussion, what I'm starting off and kicking off the discussion with this evening is the topic of child abuse, in particular child sexual molestation, and the fact that this continues to be something that we're willing to excuse, in particular, when someone is a celebrity and they have celebrity status. And when I say celebrity status, I don't always necessarily mean that they have to be as big as Michael Jackson or R. Kelly. We have people in this community who are well known, whether they are politicians, ministers, um, community leaders, and they have a reputation, business people, they have a reputation and they are known within the local community. Oh, well, that person has a history of child molestation. That person is known to you know, molest little boys. And we continue to, to look and turn a blind eye to these things. Um, why? That's, that's really the question that we need to be asking ourselves. Why are we continuing to turn a blind eye? And so I want to dissect and look at some of the things at the moment. So Jamelia is asking, how could he get bail? She's talking about, again, this just came in straight off the press. This is hot news right here on Cayman Mall Road, there's a gentleman who's being accused. I don't even want to call him a gentleman because that's not the word for him. He's a piece of shit. Let's just be honest here, right? He's being accused of molesting upwards of six children right here in the Cayman Islands. And unfortunately, he was granted bail today. So when the incident happened, you know, he was incarcerated. They did not initially give him bail. Now he's been granted bail. So Jamelia is saying, why has he been granted bail? That's a good question. That's an excellent question for the courts to answer, especially in light of the fact that this man was actually trying to escape the jurisdiction, was literally taken off of the plane, taken off of Cayman Airways as he was attempting to leave and go back to his home country of Jamaica. So how they give him bail today, I have no clue. Um, it's, it's just insane. My sources actually indicate to me that he was given his passport back as well. 
which again is quite unbelievable. So this is this, I'll summarize a little bit here what my sources said. So he's been charged with, you know, sexually assaulting six young girls. He's from Jamaica. He went back home to supposedly retire. His wife, who's Caymanian, returned to Cayman last year and he returned as well a few months later with her to visit late last year. So after being accused of child molestation, he attempted to flee the island and got on Cayman Airways. And it was at that junction that the police stopped him from leaving and he was caught in time and he's been incarcerated all of this time. The children are giving their statements. Obviously, the police investigation is in full swing, is continuing. And for whatever reason, he was actually granted bail today. And my sources actually indicate that not only was he granted bail, but his passport was returned to him. Supposedly, he has on an ankle monitor. I really don't know how much good that would do um, because we've seen people figure out how to work around those ankle monitors before. So how useful they are, only God really knows. Um, you know, we have withheld certain bits and pieces of information because we do not intend to um, give away anything that might potentially expose the victims um, in any way, shape or form, because I think it's critical at all times to protect, especially children that are victimized by these individuals. So in the larger context of this discussion, I figured that it would be useful for us to discuss both R. Kelly and Michael Jackson kind of together. So a couple of days ago, there was a two part docu-series that ran about Michael Jackson and two alleged victims have come forward indicating that they were abused by Michael Jackson. And right away, our Caymanians, people that we all know and a part of this community, they jump on the bandwagon and they're saying things like, you know, he didn't touch anybody. Mind you, I don't know how people can swear for anybody, right? If you were not there, you are simply not in a position to swear that this person never touched anyone. How couldn't you even make a statement like that? Only God knows. But at the end of the day, good evening, uh, Kayan. I hope I'm pronouncing your name correctly. Kayan or Kayan, let me know how that's pronounced with a K or like K-man. <laughs> um, we have a lot of people who are trying to defend these individuals and this behavior by making these comments like, you know, there's no way that Michael Jackson could have touched these boys. Um, there's some kind of, um, I guess it's conspiracy is the best word to use. There's some sort of conspiracy afoot to destroy Michael Jackson now that he's been dead for 10 years. There's a conspiracy afoot to destroy, um, you know, the black community, destroy uh, artists who are black. And I think that's so incredibly ridiculous. I mean, we have had tons of talented black people, African-Americans, whatever you want to call them, that have never been accused of inappropriate behavior. So far, we have these two high profile individuals who, in my mind, I don't even know why people are doubting these stories because we've always known about the inappropriate behavior of Michael Jackson. We've always known about the inappropriate behavior and the sex tape, the video evidence with their own eyes of R. Kelly. And yet it's now only in 2019 that some people are finally beginning to say, well, yeah, something is definitely wrong with this behavior. What's going on here? But on the flip side of that, we still have people who are defending the legacy that these people have created. They've created a personal legacy. And then sometimes, yes, I get that their music is a big deal to people. And people are all about, well, you know, Michael Jackson was trailblazing in terms of what he does did as an artist. There will never be anyone probably like him again. And there was certainly no one before him. And for him to have been a black man, and especially in the US, and gotten to that particular stature in life, bigger than life, um, you know, you'll recall that when they had his funeral and they aired it live, a billion people, B with a billion, B, not million, one billion people tuned in to listen to and watch his live funeral being broadcast. Those are amazing statistical 
pieces of information. But does that mean, how do you juxtapose that against someone who also enjoyed sleeping with young children? Everyone knows that he physically wanted to sleep with young children because he said it. He actually said in his own words, and I'm gonna play a little video clip here of an interview with him so that you guys can remember, because I wonder sometimes if people have forgotten some of the details and that's why now that he's been dead for 10 years, we somehow want to want to preserve this kind of late, uh, fake, sorry, legacy. Um, BBC radio stations are starting to pull his music. But this this guy is a known, I mean, again, the, the evidence is so incredibly compelling that for someone to argue otherwise, I think is very, very disturbing. So let's look at some of the facts. We've had with both R. Kelly and Michael Jackson, a long history of sexual abuse allegations. In the case of Michael Jackson, for example, he had set up um, bells and doors that people had to access before they could even get to his bedroom so that he always knew when someone was coming, right? Um, he had the ability to get advance notice that someone was coming to his room. The number one question that people seem to have is why do victims wait so long? So if you've ever done any research or you know anything about trauma survivors, you will know that the to even ask that question is a bit ridiculous. And it's not, it's something that I think we as a community have to educate ourselves about because of the simple fact that we continually say, well, why didn't you come forward? Why didn't you tell someone? One of his victims was allegedly molested over a seven year period of time. From the time he was seven years old to the time he was 14. And his name is Wade. And you can certainly go and watch the documentary. It's been all over the news. There's been a lot of, um, you know, footage of it being shown. And the thing that strikes me is how Caymanians will get on their own social media pages and they will attend, attempt to defend someone like a Michael Jackson, like an R. Kelly, but they don't even want to do the respective research. They're not gonna go and watch documentaries for themselves. They just read a headline or read a clip that, okay, BBC is pulling his, his music and they get upset. There's some grand conspiracy against black people. They don't go and watch it, right? I've taken the time to watch the R. Kelly documentary more than once. I've taken the time to so far just watch clips of the Michael Jackson alleged victims having their say. And what I will say is either these guys are the best actors in the world and deserve a Golden Globe, an Oscar, an Emmy, the whole nine yards, or there's truth to what they're saying. Now, let me clarify a couple things. Why do we find that it is appropriate for a 30-year-old man to be in bed with a seven-year-old or a 30-year-old man to be in bed with an 11-year-old child and somehow that is appropriate behavior? That's not appropriate behavior by any stretch of the imagination. That's absolutely ridiculous. Melissa, thanks for the comment. Melissa says, when it comes to Michael Jackson, I don't blame him. I blame the parents of those children why would you send your child there? Well, here's where we're going to disagree. I also blame the parents who got caught up in his fame and got caught up in the money and the lifestyle and probably the opportunities that he was going to present and the doors that he was going to open for their children and being blinded by that. And, and one of the, the alleged victims in this documentary talks about the fact how he is in therapy to this day and how him and his mother do not have a relationship because he is of the opinion that his mother essentially served him up on a silver platter for this child molester to have his way with him. So I agree that parents need to do a better job of policing the situation and they need to do a better job of ensuring that their children are not at risk and not put into situations like this. I don't care who the perpetrator is. I don't care if it's a Michael Jackson. I don't care if it's it's the Queen of England or the King of you know the United States of America or whoever. Your sole job in this world is to protect your children from this sort of thing. 
So yes, parents need to step up to the plate and take some responsibility. Where you and I will disagree, Melissa, is I cannot say I don't blame him because ultimately he is the one who did the act. He is the one who betrayed those parents and the trust that they put in him, no matter how misguided that trust was. He ultimately made those conscious decisions, allegedly, to molest and abuse children if that's what he did. And I, I wholeheartedly, with all of my heart, it is my opinion that Michael Jackson is a child molester and a repeated child molester, and he continued to get away with it for his entire life. So let's just go back a little bit and have a look at what I consider some of the pertinent questions that we should be asking. He was talking on the phone with these little boys for four hours a day. What adult in their right mind needs to do that? His own family and him have admitted that they were sleeping or allowing children to sleep in the same bed. And their excuse was, oh, Michael Jackson is, um, he's a kid himself. Really? A 30-year-old man, a 40-year-old man, you know, you're not a child. I don't care how deprived you were, what kind of childhood you had. I don't care how tough your father was on you. You are not a child. And there's absolutely no reason under this sun that we all exist that you should be sharing a bed with children. They're not your children. It's not natural for these children to be having sleepovers with an adult male. And to me, that is absolutely disgusting. What 30-year-old prefers the company of young boys that are 7 to 14 years old? And these are questions that, again, when you try to defend Michael Jackson, I would like to hear what your thought process is and what logical explanation you have for what is actually going on. It doesn't make any sense to me. Let's think about Neverland, for example, and the whole concept behind Neverland. Neverland was designed as a theme park and to give this aura of I am a child and I love all of these things and I want to play around all day and it's like all fun and games. How do you create something like Neverland as an adult to bring children in and adults don't go, hold on a second, what is this all about? This is part of the grooming process. This is how molesters, adults, groom children. This is what they do to attract these children in. The cleaning people, the helpers that work with Michael Jackson, talk about finding boys' underwear on the floor. How when they went to his facility, they were instructed by him to take off their clothes and put their clothes in a suitcase and wear his underwear. Or, you know, he would tell them to put their underwear in a drawer. Like none of this stuff is logical and makes any sense. I believe that people like Michael Jackson and R. Kelly are the ultimate predators. And they have been allowed by society to go unchecked for far too long. One of the helpers actually talked about the fact that um, there was this constant, I don't even know how to tell you guys this, but you just need to, you need to go and look at some of these videos for yourself. There was a constant, um, there was, what she said was there was Vaseline all over the place. And when the interviewer said, what do you mean by that? It would be in the golf cart. <laughs> that they use to go around the property. It would be in, um, you know, in his room. It would be hidden like all over the place. And it's like, who has Vaseline hidden all over their house? Like, what's the purpose of that? And I don't want to get too graphic, but I think you guys can figure it out. Why on earth do you allow children to sleep in bed with a grown man? Just reading some of your comments here. Carmelie, I'm a little bit, I'm not a little bit, I'm a lot disappointed in this comment. Don't care how we all try sometime, these kids are bad. Let me try to break this down to you because I'm so disappointed that you would say that. These kids are not bad. You know who's bad? It's the parents that fail the children 
and put them in these situations with adults when they should not be, and then turn around and try to blame children for the adult's behavior. It's the parents that have failed their children time and time again in more ways than one, where a child somehow thinks that if an adult male comes up to me or an adult female comes up to me and they offer me something, they offer me money or candy or whatever, I have to take it and then give up my body, give up who I am. The parents have done that, not the children. These children are born into this world innocent. We expose them to the BS. We expose them to the harm. We expose them to the predators. This is not about bad children. This is about bad people like Michael Jackson, R. Kelly. And it's also about bad parents. So anybody in my mind who tries to blame a child for being a victim needs to have their heads checked. I'm sorry. Bring the kids in and building Neverland. Nothing was wrong with it. It's a sleeping together and the secret behind it. But you're missing the point, Melissa. You're missing the point that I'm saying. The point that I'm saying is, what is the motive behind what he was doing? There's an entire process. You need to look bigger than, oh, I'm just sleeping with these children. You need to understand that he created an environment in which it was fun. It was a playground. It was, you know, kids are going to want to come here. That's the whole idea behind it. That is why he created, in my opinion, some place like Neverland to begin with. So I'm afraid that I'm, I don't know if I'm not explaining this properly, but you're missing what I'm trying to say. That there is a lot of things that these predators do. There's a reason why they put themselves in position of trust. There's a reason why they wear the cloth of God and pretend to be godly men or women. There's a reason why, <coughs> sorry, they become coaches and they pretend to be trying to help people in communities. That's what I'm saying. And if you don't see that, you're missing, you're not fully understanding how the entire grooming process works. Cora says there's a special place in hell for people who abuse children. I couldn't agree more. Absolutely. I agree 100% with that. Nicole, thank you for joining the conversation. Melissa says she wasn't seeing it that way. And this is why I'm having this discussion, Melissa. I'm not trying to call you out, but I think that a lot of us who even have children, we are not seeing and we don't understand how this works. And that is precisely why our children are at significant risk. We're not thinking like a perpetrator, but you have to think like a perpetrator and understand what it is that they do in order for you to be in a position to truly protect your children. This is grooming. This is what is done. So I'm glad that hopefully you can see it a little bit differently now <clears throat> because that means that our job is that much more challenging if we don't see what's really occurring around us. Okay. You guys remember, some of you may remember this documentary that was done by Martin Bashir on Michael Jackson. Um, Aaron, I'm not ignoring your comments, but we're trying to just stay on topic. So tonight we are talking specifically about child molestation and abuse. If we have time at the end of the program to talk about domestic abuse, we're certainly gonna get there. But this, this particular topic really demands our full attention without any distraction. So that's what I'm trying to do here. So I'm not trying to ignore your comments at all, Aaron. Um, we can definitely get to that discussion because dom domestic abuse <clears throat> deserves a lot of attention as well. But tonight we are talking about child abuse and child molestation and why we continue to give these people because they're celebrities or they're well-known people in the community, whatever the situation is, we continue to give them a pass. Now, one of the defenses that Michael Jackson always used was, oh, he's a little boy. This is what his family says. He's a little boy himself. He never had a childhood. And that's why it's fine for young children to sleep in bed with him. 
That makes absolutely no sense. You're a grown man. You are an adult. You are a big man. It doesn't make any logical sense to say that is the reason why a young child, seven to 11, and sometimes even younger, should be sleeping in your room. But as someone said, fame is the biggest seduction. And that is very, very true. Oprah Winfrey did 217 shows on child abuse, sexual child abuse, because as many of us know, she was a victim herself. 217 shows. And you know what? Not until now, when she interviewed after the two-part documentary aid, she then interviewed the two alleged victims, interviewed them, did a one-on-one -on -one interview, and that aired after the documentary. Only now are people trying to attack Oprah, her character, <clears throat> about how she's trying to destroy Michael Jackson's legacy, how they at some point liked her, but now, you know, they're not so sure because of what she's doing. After 217 shows, this is, I'm trying to show you guys something here about the strength of celebrityism and how far that can go in getting people to really ignore and give people a pass when they should not be getting one. People are wearing blinders and we give these people power over us and we put a lot of faith in them when in truth we shouldn't i'm gonna play a clip here from an interview and again i am gonna share some of these links so you guys can go back and refresh your memory because i think some of us are a little bit younger than others and you may not remember that michael jackson they actually raided his neverland they tried to collect evidence they took him to court but I want you guys to listen to this and really consider what he's saying. So this clip that I'm going to play is him sitting down with a 12-year-old cancer survivor. This child had cancer. So what does he do? He prays up on the most vulnerable in our community, a child who is sick, invites him to come to his home. Now, of course, what mother's thinking, Michael Jackson, the most famous man of his time is actually going to molest and abuse my cancer stricken child, right? So he invites his child to come into his home and stay with him. Oh, I want to help you. I want to help your family pay their medical bills. You know, I want to do all of this seemingly um, nice stuff, not realizing that she was sending her 12 year old child right into the lion's den, straight into the lion's bedroom. Now, he was interviewed about this and listen to what he said. So I want you guys to really hear this carefully. What looked particularly bad was this. 12-year-old Gavin Arviso had been recovering from cancer when Jackson met and befriended him. In the documentary, Martin Bashir asked the young boy about the sleeping arrangements at Neverland. And then he finally said, okay, do you love me? I can sleep on the bed. I was like, oh, man. And so I, I was slept on the bed. But Michael, you know, you're a 44-year-old man now. What, what do you get out of this? What do you get out of it? You can just share your bed. The, the, the most lovely thing to do is to share your bed with someone. Yeah, of course. After the broadcast, Michael Jackson accused Bashir of betraying his trust. All right, so you you see this 12-year-old. I know you guys don't have the video, but I'm actually going to post it in the comment section so that you can go and view it for yourself. So I think you should view the entire thing. Um, so you have this 12-year-old child who's recovering from cancer, essentially saying that Michael Jackson said to him, if you love me, you will sleep in my bed. Imagine this. At the time, Michael Jackson was 44 years old. 
And this young man is 12. On a serious note, for real? A 44-year-old telling a 12-year-old, if you love me, you will sleep in my bed. And did you hear what Michael Jackson said when he was asked, do you really think this is normal? Like, what sense does this make? The most loving thing to do, he replies, is to sleep with someone in their bed. Really? That sleeping with someone in their bed is the most loving thing to do. And somehow you think that that is appropriate with a 12-year-old child. You want to show a 12-year-old child how much you love them. A cancer survivor. So apparently there is no other way to show this young child how much you love them, but to have them sleep in your bed. People, you need to wake up. This is a call for people in this community and communities across the Caribbean, especially and across the world to wake up. We are putting our children at risk when we turn a blind eye to this foolishness. This behavior is absolutely ridiculous. No one in their right mind should think that this kind of behavior is appropriate. But celebrities get a certain protection. Nicole, you're absolutely right. This is sick behavior. When you hear, and I'm going to encourage you guys, I'm going to be doing a viewing party with my friends so that we can sit down, watch, just like we did with the R. Kelly documentary. We're going to see Michael Jackson one. It's only two parts, and then there's the Oprah interview. And we're going to have some real discussions as parents. Some of us have children. Some of us don't have children, but we're all part of this community. We need to ask ourselves some serious questions. Why do we think the way that we do? Why do we think that this kind of behavior is okay? Why do we not see the truth of what's going on here? Michael Jackson paid off one young man $22 million. That was silence bought. That was another life ruined for $22 million. But we continue to wear the blinders and we continue to allow this to go on. <clears throat> In the documentary, one of the alleged victims talks about the fact that Michael Jackson tried to penetrate him. And when he went home, he gets this frantic call from Michael Jackson. You know, where's the underwear that you were wearing? And he was like, I don't know. I think I threw it in the wash. Why? No, 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 no. You have to get that and bring it back here because it actually would have had blood on it and physical evidence of what he was actually trying to do to this young boy. I'm sorry, but when people say, oh, these victims are looking for money, 10 years after the man is dead, you're gonna be looking for money? You're gonna put yourself and your family, all of your business out there these, some of these guys are now fathers. They have families of their own. They're married. And they said that when they started to have a family, they started to have children. They started to reevaluate what had happened to them. Because in fact, they had tried to, because this is what perpetrators do, they will often get other victims to come forward and say, no, I hung out with Michael Jackson all the time and he never abused me. So then the question becomes, Oh, well, if he didn't abuse you, we can't believe that he would abuse anybody. Well, that's not true. People may have a preference. One person might have been more vulnerable. One, one child might have been more attractive, attractive to him. There's a, a myriad of reasons why he didn't abuse every single child that came into his place. I don't suppose he would have been able to create any music had he been doing that. So, you know, we need to think logically at some point about how this really starts to play out. Because it trickles down. The way that you see a celebrity and the way that you can defend their behavior and question the victims and blame the victims is the same way when it happens at a lower level that we want to question and blame people as well. If I had a dollar for every single child molestation story that came out, when people, especially when the child is a little bit older in the teen years. We want to blame that child and put that responsibility on that child. 
you guys remember the case with um, Web Webster, who was a former political candidate for Baden Town, when he molested the young lady. Thank God she got it in video, but people are questioning, oh, well, why did she videotape this? What was this really all about? Had she not videotaped it, it would have been her word against his, and he probably would have gotten off. Now, it's well known in the community. Everybody was talking about how he's buying these young girls presents. He was being inappropriate with them, wanting to hang out at the church youth group and doing all these sorts of things. So when it came out, it really shouldn't have been a surprise or shock to anyone. But what was the first thing that a lot of people attempted to do? Oh, well, who's the victim? How can we blame her? She was too fast. She was too this. She's, she's a bad child. She's too mature. That's how we try to put the blame on everyone but the perpetrator. And that's why I have to call people out. Carmelie, I might love you otherwise, but that comment that you made about children being bad and that's why they're being molested is completely wrong. I've never heard such a disgusting comment in my life. That, that type of thinking is why I'm sitting here dedicating my time to try to get people to realize, stop blaming children, stop blaming victims. A child is 14, 15 years old. How can you compare their experience and their life knowledge and understanding or even their emotional development, their psychological development to that of a 40, 50, 60 year old man? Come on, really? Because that's what you're doing when you're saying it's a child's fault that they're just bad. How can that be a child's fault when they have been manipulated? As adults, we have been in relationships where we have fallen prey to physical abusers, psychological abusers, all of these things. And we are adults. We've had some life experience. And still there's somebody out there who is wiser than us. And who was able to hoodwink us into a situation? Who was able to hoodwink us into, you know, being a side piece or whatever the situation was? We were victimized. So when you see a young child being caught in that situation, why can you not understand and comprehend how that's very possible? Given the level of maturity, knowing that the teenage brain does not even fully develop until you're in your mid twenties. That's why there are laws in place to try to protect children as much as possible. And that's why as a community, we have to step up to the plate. Forget how popular somebody is. Forget what their social media presence says or how many followers they have on social media. None of that matters when it comes to protecting your children because they are our most precious commodity. No child is born bad. We create, as parents, we create situations and environments for children to be exposed to all sorts of foolishness and not get the protection that they deserve. So when we have damaged children that are out there looking for love and attention, we should take the blame for that. We're the ones who've done that. And we need to ask ourselves some really hardcore questions about how we continue to do this and allow this to happen in our communities and try to blame the victims. So again, why do we victim blame? Why is it that our first thought is, where were the parents? What, what, what was the victim doing there? Why is it not, oh my God, this perpetrator is wrong. Why is he doing this? Why is he taking advantage of a situation, of that child, of that parent's trust, of that situation. I see some of you are tuned in. Thank you very much. We've got over 30 of you watching. I'm trying to see if I can do a poll. The last time we attempted to do a poll, it didn't really work. So I know the technicians are working on this issue for me to see if we can somehow get the poll working. Cora says that there's many victims who don't speak out about being abused because they know they'll be blamed for what happened to them. I could not agree with that sentiment more. That is the number one reason why victims remain silent. Because they 
don't want to be re-victimized and put under the telescope of people out in the community who are all about, well, we need to look for a reason why he picked you because there must be something wrong with you. You see how that would make somebody feel? You're the problem. And they get re-victimized as a result of that. There's also a lot of shame that goes into this. And the perpetrators will often tell their victims, well, if you tell anyone, I'm going to get in trouble, but so are you. And that's exactly what we do as a community. We prove perpetrators right when we try to victim blame. They get dragged through the mud because we don't want to believe that someone like Michael Jackson could be capable of something like this. Look at Michael Jackson. Look at his erratic behaviors and some of the things that he did, holding his baby out of a window ledge, right? Almost dropping the baby. Does that look like someone who, who you could say, well, no, he would never molest anybody? No. He doesn't even come close to getting a pass, but people are gonna give him a pass because he created great music. Just like they gave R. Kelly a pass, people saw the video with him and an underage child. There's no doubt that she was a minor and a jury still found him not guilty. Why? Because Had her as a child hoodwinked into going along with us? And what else is she going to do? Tell her parents no. So now as a 14-year-old child, you have nowhere to stay. You've just disagreed with your parents. We're going to kick you out. I mean, what is the solution when you're going up against that much power and money and position? And people in our communities continue to want to protect these perpetrators because, oh, they're famous. Oh, because they're so-and-so. Nicole says a Caymanian woman shared her sexual abuse with me from her childhood years, trusted, told adult, beat her. Wow. So again, these are the repercussions for victims when they decide to come forward and when they speak out. They are the ones who are told that they're wrong, they're bad. Instead of getting therapy to try to overcome this trauma that has happened to them, they're put in a situation where they get beat for it. They get called liars. And oh, you're just too fast, as Caribbean people like to say, or called worse than that. You're a whore, you're a this, you're a that. And the perpetrators get to continue on doing what they do, molesting their children and getting a pass for it. Patrick wants to know who's pedophile. Well, Patrick, if you just joined the conversation late, we're having a general conversation about Michael Jackson, R. Kelly, these celebrity pedophiles. But we're also bringing it very back home because today, one of our own local pedophiles got bail after allegedly molesting up to six children. And he is now out on bail Police caught him trying to leave the jurisdiction on Cayman Airways. Now they've given him his passport back. He's on bail and he's wearing an ankle bracelet. I'm going to share a couple other links with you guys, but I want you to listen to this one again. And this is one of his victims, one of the alleged victims that has participated in the documentary. I was seven years old. Michael asked family want to come to Neverland. We drive in and then forget about all your problems. You were in Neverland. It was a fantasy. Come away. Today is your birthday. So congratulations. I love you. Goodbye. He told me if they ever found out what we were doing. He and I <clears throat> go to jail for the rest of our lives. All right, so there you have it. He was seven years old at the time, told, oh, if anybody ever finds out, you, you and I will go to jail for the rest of our lives. That's what we're talking about, that type of manipulation. Manipulating the parents into thinking, oh, this is gonna be good for him. 
let him come hang out with us, surrounding himself with other children. Oh, this is a place where children can feel safe. Children running all over the place to gain your trust. That's how perpetrators work, folks. We need to wake up. We need to stop with the blame on the victims. Even when people say to me, well, what were the parents doing? I agree that as parents, we need to open our eyes and we need to do a better job. But when people are asking that question, they're asking the question because they're looking to displace blame. Again, they don't wanna address the perpetrator. They don't wanna blame the perpetrator. They're trying to look for somebody else. And the parents are convenient people to blame. A lot of these parents themselves were abused and victimized. And so they become easy prey for a predator. He knows, you know, she's a single mother. She needs help. Um, she's in a vulnerable situation. You guys remember the head coach? I can't remember the name of the team right now, but he's the one who molested all of those children. They sent him off to jail as well in the US and they had a nonprofit organization set up helping at-risk youths. So he had a pick of the litter because these were at-risk youths. Nobody were paying attention to what was going on with them. Oh, you get this opportunity to be in this program. You should be thankful that anyone cares about inner city black people or inner city kids at all, you know? How about that? Sandusky, thank you, Nicole. I just couldn't, that one didn't come to my mind just then. Penn State, that's right. So again, a lot of people turned a blind eye to what this man was doing and how he was molesting these children. So this is another good one when people say, oh, this is people trying to tear down the black community. I do not agree because there've been tons of examples of other people who like Sam Dusky, who have been exposed and brought down, he's not black, okay? So he was exposed, that made news. There was also the coach from the gymnastics team. He wasn't black, that made news. But as black people, and I'm speaking to Caribbean people and people of color, we're always looking for some bullshit reason to not call a spade a spade and to not say, this person's a child molester, this person is a child abuser. Instead, we want to make this a color issue. They're attacking people because they are black and you know all these celebrities. No, a lot of white people have had their lives destroyed. Yep, he was raping these underprivileged kids in the basement of his home while his wife was upstairs turning a blind eye. Nassar, absolutely, he was the coach. So I get frustrated when I see this dialogue happening in social media where people are trying to make this a racial issue and trying to make people think, well, they're just coming after us because we're black. That's ridiculous. Let's stop the foolishness. Let's talk about how we can educate ourselves as parents and try to protect our children. Johan Moxham says, from a local context, are there any stats on reported abuse cases in the Cayman Islands kept by the RCAPS are relevant? CIG agencies. Well, they have told us that there's an uptake on the number of um, abuse allegations. It could be that more are being reported. But listen, this is the most underreported type of offense and crime out there. Especially with child victims, they simply don't come forward. There is a process that people have to go through sometimes before they can even talk about this. And even then, there are a lot of times when they're never able to share who victimized them or what happened or any of the details. So when you see someone, it took someone 20 years, you need to understand how trauma works and how being abused actually impacts someone forever. It destroys their lives. This is not fun and games and joke and something that you can just sit down and open up about just like that. Nicole, I absolutely agree with you. Young black girls and boys, I'm going to add, have gone unheard and abused for far too long. This is about finally standing up for the young black girls. And that is one of the takeaways from the whole R. Kelly situation. 
everyone said, listen, the reason why this man has been able to get away with this for as long as he has, with so much blatant evidence out there and everybody just turning a blind eye, was because of who the victims were. Most of them came from the inner city of Chicago. Nobody cared about them. And it was a black on black crime, even worse. So the black community turns a blind eye when it is their own that are the perpetrators. And that is the honest truth. And so that kind of blind eye, when finally if the authorities now have 10 charges against him, and we continue to find excuses. And in the case of um, Michael Jackson, the excuse is, oh, well, he is um, dead. And a dead man can't defend himself. Well, guess what? His victims are still very much alive. And there was sufficient evidence to take in the court to begin with back in the 2000s. But what happened? A jury let him go. Because juries are kind of easy to convince, oh, there might be some reasonable doubt. Here's a celebrity. Who are we really going to, you know, believe here? Some little kid or a celebrity with high paid lawyers and all of this other stuff. That's what it's all about. And they continue to get away with it. So I wanted to dedicate this show this evening because I think, like I said, there is a lot that we need to answer for as parents, as community leaders, as just people who live and make comments on social media. There has to be some amount of responsibility when we're trying to take up for someone that we don't even know, that we want to claim that they're so incredibly innocent. I would challenge all of you, right? go and watch it. If you've not seen the Michael Jackson documentary, but you're trying to defend Michael Jackson, go and watch it. See for yourselves how these two men who are now adults are still dealing with this situation. See how they're in therapy, how they're not even talking to their mothers who they blame for putting them in this position. No one's going to do all of this and make all of this up just to make Michael Jackson the biggest pop artist ever to try to make him look bad. That doesn't make any logical sense. And in the process, how people calling them liars and money hungry people and making themselves look bad. That just isn't how this works. Next week on Tuesday. So today's Thursday. This is our final show for the week. Next week, Tuesday, we're going to have a show with Nicole. Nicole, as you can see, has been commenting throughout the evening. Nicole Eastman is actually um, a survivor herself of child sexual abuse. And she's going to be sh sharing her story with us. And I'm so pleased, Nicole, I can't thank you enough for agreeing to do that show. I hope that we have, you know, when we talked about Matthew Leslie, who again has allegations of inappropriate behavior with underage girls, we had over 300 people tuned into that show. I hope that we can break that record next week, Tuesday, and have over 300 people tuned into the program to listen to Nicole as a survivor talk about her ordeal, her personal experience, so that we can all learn something from the perspective of a survivor. And we can all take away that just being that much more educated and learning how to protect our children and how to spot dangerous situations when it comes to our children. So please, next week, Tuesday at seven o'clock, tune into that program, show your love and support for Nicole, because not everybody, I can tell you the vast majority of people, even if they're willing to talk to me one-on-one -on -one about their situation, about their abuse, they're not going to get on the airwaves and talk about it. And we found someone who lives in this community who's a beautiful person, she's a family of her own, who's willing to share her experience. So I invite you all to please tune in next week, Tuesday at seven o'clock. So again, this evening, we have some bad news. An alleged child predator who is alleged to have at least six victims. Keep in mind that the vast majority of people who 
are finally caught or finally exposed, they have a long list of victims out there before they're ever caught. And the majority of those victims will remain silent. And we have to keep that in mind. When I speak out, when Nicole speaks out, when Ms. Cora speaks out, we're speaking out for the silent majority. In this case, it's not the silent minority, it's the silent majority who are not able to speak for themselves. That's why I'm sitting here tonight. That's why I'm challenging anyone who feels it necessary to comment and try to protect these people, that there's something wrong with what you're doing. I wanna just read one little comment here from one of her, she's actually not tuned in at the moment, so I hope Tina doesn't mind me sharing this, but this was such a profound post that she shared in definite contrast to some of the other people out there who are trying to defend these child molesters. So Tina said, I firmly believe that Michael Jackson was a serial child sexual abuser and pedophile. I haven't voluntarily listened to the music since the first allegation. I also believe R. Kelly is an abusive sexual predator. I once was a huge fan and I stopped listening to his music after the first allegations. My favorite musical artist to ever live was Prince. If I find out, if I found out, sorry, that he was an abusive pedophile, I would stop listening to him too. Yes, talent is rare and admirable, but decency counts for far more in my book. Tina, you summed it up 100% spot on and I could not have said it any better. So I'm just going to leave us right there with that final comment. Thank you all for tuning in this evening and supporting this podcast. We will see you guys again on Tuesday evening. And just as a reminder, we'll actually have a child abuse survivor joining us in studio. You guys have a wonderful and safe evening and please be safe on the roadways. Have a wonderful weekend.